Well, I would like to tell you something about the story of helicity. What is helicity in fluid mechanics and why it is important? This uh, dates back to the middle of the 19th century, to the work of uh, Helmholtz, famous work of Helmholtz and Kelvin, um, who both realized in different ways that vortex lines are, as we would say, frozen in the fluid. They are transported with the flow. Now, vorticity is the curl of the velocity field. And so the vortex lines we can think of as the lines of spin as you go through the fluid. Of course, a vortex is very familiar in context. For example, a hurricane. You have a swirling flow and the vorticity is vertically upwards. That is the direction uh, associated with the spin. So um, Kelvin realized that uh, because the vortex lines are frozen in the flow, if you have any knot, knotted vortex line or any linkage, for example, two vortices that are linked together, uh, then that linkage will be permanent in an ideal fluid, that is to say a fluid without internal friction, without viscosity. And Kelvin was very excited about this because he identified, he thought, he constructed a theory, he described it the vortex theory of atoms. He believed that uh, the universe was full of a, a fluid, an imaginary fluid called the ether. And uh, in that ether, um, there were little knotted vortices. And for example, every element would be represented by one particular knot. And the permanence of these knots he, he associated with the stability of the elements, like hydrogen and helium and lithium and so on. So hydrogen would be a simple unknot, a simple vortex ring, whereas helium might be the next most complicated, two linked rings, or a trefoil knot, and so on. So as you go up through the periodic table, Kelvin imagined that you go up through the complex sequence of knots. Now that idea actually stimulated the development of the branch of mathematics known as knot theory. Huge activity in the late part of the 19th century. Now um, I came into this in the 1960s, so a hundred years later, and I was lucky enough to stumble on uh, an invariant of the Euler equations. The Euler equations describe the flow of a, a perfect ideal fluid. These are equations that date back uh, 250 years to 1756. And we know, we had known for a long time certain uh, invariants. The energy, for example, is an invariant. The momentum, the angular momentum, these are all very well known. Yeah, but this new invariant discovered in the 1960s is the helicity invariant. It is the integral over the flow of the scalar product of the velocity field and the spin field, the vorticity. You take the product of these two and you get what is described as the helicity density. And the integral over the whole flow is the total helicity. And that is an invariant. And what does it mean? It simply, its interpretation physically is that it is a measure of the linkage or the knottedness of the vortex lines, which can be very complicated in space, particularly in a turbulent flow. Well, this was rather an exciting discovery, and it was even more exciting because the first application turned out to be the, to the problem of um, uh, dynamo instability. Uh, in an electrically conducting fluid. And um, it's now known, well known, that uh, if you have a fluid in turbulent motion and the mean helicity, that's say the average helicity over the whole fluid is non-zero, then the medium is unstable to the growth of a magnetic field on a large length scale provided only that the extent of the fluid domain is large enough. Now, when we say large enough here, we're talking about astrophysical context. Uh, the interstellar medium, for example, is large enough. But even at the planetary scale, if you go down towards the center of the Earth, 
the liquid core of the Earth is large enough for this theory to be applicable. And uh, we now know that the Earth's magnetic field, for example, is due to a combination of effects in the liquid core. One of these is um, due to the rotation, Coriolis effects, uh, that again are very standard and very well understood. But the second crucial effect is associated with the helicity of the random convection, uh, thermal convection or compositional convection in the core. The helicity is non-zero. And this gives rise to an effect that is known now as the alpha effect. The combination of these two effects, alpha effect and differential rotation, gives you the magnetic field of the Earth. And also can give you um, reversals of polarity of the magnetic field of the Earth, which is one of the uh, very important uh, observations that uh, theoreticians have to try and explain. Now, this subject has been given a huge boost um, just a few years ago by the success of an experiment in France, in uh, Cadarache, south of France, where they're developing the new uh, thermonuclear fusion project called ITER, I-T-E-R. But during this, they were able to conduct an experiment. It's called the VKS experiment, that is von Karman sodium experiment. Von Karman was famous uh, fluid dynamicist of the 20th century. Sodium, liquid sodium, is a highly conducting fluid, very inflammable, very dangerous fluid. And that's why you need very, it's a very difficult experiment. But it's conducted in a large cylinder with two counter-rotating propellers, which generate a flow with deliberately non-zero helicity. I should say that helicity is interesting because it is what's known as a, it's not a scalar quantity like energy, it's a pseudo-scalar. If uh, you change your frame of reference from a right-handed to a left-handed frame, then helicity changes sign. In that sense, pseudo-scalar. It's a quantity that lacks reflection symmetry. So you need this lack of reflection symmetry in a flow to get the helical effect. You do get that whenever you have convection upwards combined with rotation. So that gives you the twist, which may be right-handed. It's right-handed in the northern hemisphere, left-handed in the southern hemisphere, but that is enough. Both domains are large enough to give the dynamo instability. So this is one extremely important application where helicity, non-zero helicity, plays uh, uh, an absolutely crucial part. Not only the magnetic field of the Earth, but also of stars um, and also the galactic magnetic field. Wherever you look out there, there are magnetic fields and uh, the, the um, helicity of the background turbulent flow it plays uh, an important part in this phenomenon. Now, helicity also has received a great boost just this year. Another beautiful experiment carried out in Chicago by William Irvin and uh, his student Dustin Kleckner, uh, who have generated a knotted vortex for the first time in uh, an experiment in water. Uh, so you can see this, uh, their, their video is available on the web. Um, a beautiful experiment, it, the, the vortex is visualized in water by um, bubbles. Um, bubbles are attracted to the core of the vortex where the pressure is minimal. So you can see the knotted vortex and uh, it's very unstable. And this is one reason why Kelvin's theory did not actually survive his theory of vortex atoms. These vortex knotted vortices uh, can be created, we know now, but they're always unstable. Um, if only Kelvin had phrased his theory in terms of magnetic flux tubes instead of vortices, he might have been more successful because a knotted magnetic flux tube in a conducting fluid can relax to a minimum energy state that is stable and conserves its knotted structure. That is stable, um, but the analogous vort vortex distribution is horribly unstable. 
Um, and that instability shows up in the experiment of Irvin and Kleckner. And uh, we are now still, I mean, one of the outstanding problems is to understand the nature of this instability, and in particular, how the uh, Irvin trefoil vortex uh, evolves. It actually separates the knot, splits into two vortex rings, and just how that split occurs involves what is known as vortex reconnection. And that is a problem, well, it's still a problem for the future to fully understand the nature of this uh, reconnection process.